Okay, can you all hear me? I'm very small and very little, so the ones at the back might not see me very well, but I'll try to move, maybe my back is, is always really bad, my lower back, so I tend, have to sit and stand up and then sit and stand up from time to time just because of my back. Um, yes, as Roberto, it's, I mean, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a bit disappointed about the weather, you know. For once I come here, it's nicer in Bristol than in Italy, oh, but there we go. We'll have to bear with that. And also, yes, as Roberto mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, raise your hands. If you want me to stop at any time, throw me something. If I haven't seen you, if you haven't got my attention, if possible, something like a mobile, like an iPhone 10 or something like that, so I can take home. But otherwise, no, just raise your hands, and I'll stop and explain in more detail. Um, so I'm going to talk you through some of the changes uh, in terms of EU foreign policy, the kind of the discursive changes that we've seen in the past two, three years in relation to the implementation of the EU global strategy and how this applies to the EU's foreign policy in the neighborhood and with a specific focus on the Western Balkans, which is what I know a bit better. Um, I also understand from Roberto that you also heard Natalie Tocci um, some time ago, so this kind of follows from her presentation on the EU global strategy, but, but I will also go back to some of the points uh, uh, in relation to the EU global strategy so that kind of you, you can re remember some of those things. Um, these are some of the kind of the key questions that I will address today. Oh, first of all, because I will be talking about resilience. So what is resilience? Um, why is the EU interested in building resilience, in particular in the neighborhood? And what contribution can resilience make in EU foreign policy? But also what are the main challenges? Um, specifically in relation to the Western Balkans, how can this be done? And how does this help us in relation to the Western Balkans? And as a, as a whole, can we say that this is a new foreign policy paradigm for the EU? So I'll, I'll talk you through some of these, might go back and forth, um, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover uh, all these questions in the presentation. So let's start with what is resilience. Um, resilience, as you know, comes from the Latin resilio, which means to jump back. And this is a term, obviously, translates differently in different languages. I don't know exactly what's the translation in Italian. Resilienza? Something like that? Yeah, silenza. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it doesn't always translate very well into other languages. Uh, but it comes from the Latin, resilio, which is, uh, as I said, to jump back. And the term was first used in engineering to refer to the ability of some materials to go back to their original form, right? It's a property that those materials have. So you, you, know, you stretch them, they can come back to their form without breaking, without you know, suffering you know, a major shock. So this, is, this kind of thinking has then been incorporated into other disciplines, prim primarily and first of all into ecological resilience and in, in ecological resilience, particularly in the writings of Holland, um, the term then uh, changes slightly from meaning uh, going back to the original form, so the kind of status quo kind of uh, tendency of some materials, to a much more transformative understanding of resilience, where resilience means the ability of an ecological system, in this case, to absorb changes, shocks, and persist. That's how Hollins understands and that how, uh, how it, the term has been understood in ecological resilience. Again, the term has been kind of stretched, if you want. Uh, there's been a lot of conceptual stretching of the, the, the term resilience, and it has been also used in other disciplines, from psychology to refer to individual, individual resilience, to economics, resilience of financial organizations, uh, economic organizations, to more recently, and this is the topic of today's lecture, 
uh, you know, international relations, in particular international interventions, so development, humanitarian action, and peace building. And this is, this is where resilience kind of comes in, kind of in, in the EU context, and that's where it comes from. So generally, we could define resilience, so following this discussion, as the ability of, of any system, so an individual community, whether it's an organization of a state, to withstand, to adapt, or, or and recover from shocks and crises. So this is kind of the very broad definition of resilience. And um, interestingly, my surname, Juncos, is a, a very good example of resilience. Juncos means reed in English, so that plant that you have in the middle, like the plants that you can see near rivers generally. And, and reeds are very resilient because they can withstand you know, wind and other kind of external shocks and generally they go back to their original form and even if they don't go exactly b uh, back to their original form, they kind of persist and endure those, those shocks um, you know, quite well. And I also like the picture of Tiger, obviously, and he's bouncing back uh, uh, generally. So that's also another, another way of kind of picture resilience for you. Um, resilience needs to be also con be, needs to be con contextualized also in a in a in a in a, in a context of um, changes at the global level, and in particular in the way we understand the world. So for for many centuries, we understood the, the world as one of, uh, as a linear way, a kind of uh, model of cause and effect where we could predict what, it will hap uh, what will take place in the physical and the, so the social world by looking at the causes and then exploring what the effects were. So they kind of, they, you know, started raining, then I will need an umbrella. Uh, however, our understanding of the world these days has evolved to the ideas of complexity, okay? So the world is not seen anymore as these very linear models, but non-linear models where we can see different, multiple levels, multiple causes, multiple dimensions, and all of them are interconnected and interrelated. So it's very difficult in that complex world to predict what's going to happen because of this multi-causality, if you want. And also that means that we live in a world of radical uncertainty, okay? And this is where resilience becomes particularly useful as a concept. Because in this world of complexity, what we need to do is not to predict, but to be prepared. We need to develop a, an ability to self-organize, to learn, uh, to evolve and to adapt to these external shocks and events without kind of perishing, okay? And this is what resilience entails, this ability in this complex world to, to, to persist. And this applies, as, as, as I mentioned before, to both individuals, communities, and states, okay? So resilience has to be, and is uh, very, very linked to these ideas of complexity and global uncertainty. As I said, these ideas of resilience have now been taken up at the international level, and they have gone from, um, you know, from disciplines such as systems ecology to being embraced more broadly by the social sciences and also by policymakers, interestingly. For example, at the UN level, uh, you know, we have new ideas about sustaining peace rather than the kind of the uh, old past models of the liberal peace. We, resilience has been also incorporated into models of disaster management and, and reconstruction. We also um, has been used in, in, in the context of climate change, etc. Um, and as I said, uh, because of this global complexity and uncertainty, individuals and communities need to adapt, anticipate and respond to these shocks. This means that it's very difficult to go back to the status quo, but what, what we require is to adapt and to transform. So it's a very transformative uh, way of understanding resilience. And this also implies a new philosophy of life. So what we need to do is not fear uncertainty and complexity. We need to embrace it and we need to embrace change, 
Okay? This is why also some social scientists, in particular critical scholars, have uh, referred to resilience as a new mode of governance because it, it you know, leads, um, leads us to think about particular ways of kind of disciplining and, and governing subjects, but I won't be going that route today. I'll just leave that for another day. Um, but as, as you can see, all these ideas have been taken up in particular in the context of development, humanitarian action, and peace building as a way to respond also to the failures of past liberal interventions of the 1990s and the 2000s. So what is resilient more specifically? I just gave you a very broad definition, but the the issue with resilience obviously is, is, is also still very contested, in particular in the social sciences. So what is resilience is not clear to everyone and, in, and the ways we promote resilience is also not agreed by everyone, which makes this implementation rather difficult, both at the international level but also in the context of the EU. For example, if you think about what is resilience, resilience could be, um, you know, just um, you know, kind of um, a focus on the external shocks, or it could be more of a focus on the kind of internal forms of resilience, resilience to trauma. Who should be made resilient? Should it be the individual? Should it be the community? Or should it be the states? And the answer to that question is particularly important because sometimes making individuals resilient uh, my goal might be very different than making the states resilient, and sometimes making the states resilient might undermine individual resilience, especially in the context of, of authoritarian regimes. You, you think, of, for example, if we support uh, states that are, you know, authoritarian or semi-authoritarian, and we're trying to to maintain those uh, regimes stable, that might actually undermine resilience at lower levels, at the community level and the individual level. So the way we understand who should be resilient is obviously particularly relevant in the context of uh, international interventions. Um, in relation to the question about resilience against what, again, there are different answers here. So you could think about resilience against like these big shocks, these kind of one-off kind of critical junctures, if you want. But we can also think about resilience as kind of developing this ability to cope with kind of structural changes, you know, kind of long-term changes, everyday kind of issues, okay? Um, so there's a slightly, again, difference is depending on whether you think about all these big events or whether you think about these kind of everyday stresses. Um, when should resilience be achieved? Um, again, different views here. Some people think that resilience, sh we should be focusing on the pre kind of shock, that we should be focusing on preparing uh, and, and, and preparedness, prevention, while other people think that the emphasis should be on the kind of the post-shock and on the recovering, on the coping, and on the learning after the event has taken place. So again, uh, different views as to when resilience should be achieved. And finally, and more importantly, when it comes to international in interventions, is how can we achieve resilience? Can we engineer resilience from the outside? And I hear, obviously, there are very critical voices, in particular people like Chandler and others might argue that we cannot promote resilience from the outside, that we have to all, resilience is something um, you know, that needs to come from the individuals or the communities themselves, that it's an internal capacity of those, it's about developing those internal capacities and that, that cannot be done from the outside. So I think the EU has more a view of resilience can be promoted or at least facilitated from the outside, but that's not always in agreement with other scholars. So as you can see, even the term itself uh, already raises some you know, some questions and is, is rather contested, which ma makes this implementation um, particularly difficult. Any questions so far? No? Anything that you want me to clarify? 
So this is just in terms of the background of, uh, in relation to the concept of resilience more generally. So how and why is this being adopted at the European level? So in order to understand why resilience has become such an important concept at the European level, we have to go back to understanding the, concept, the context in which it first emerged and, and it, when it was first adopted in the EU Global Strategy, I think there were over 40 references to resilience in the EU Global Strategy, which is quite a lot, especially if you think about how long the, the text is. And even prior to that, there were obviously res, uh, references to the resilience. So why has the EU and, uh, and, and the EU member states, because this also has been adopted at the member state level, uh, gone for this particular concept, especially given how contested it is? Well, we need to then understand, obviously, the crisis that Europe was undergoing at the time, so in particular, during you know, uh, 2014, 15, 16, as you know, the, the EU Global Strategy was adopted in 2016, just after the UK referendum. So there was you know, this kind of compounded Euro crisis. First of all, a worsening of the geopolitical context with trouble in the, in the south, in particular in the cases of Syria. You know, we had uh, Daesh and the terrorist threat in the in the south, but also conflicts in, Le in, in Libya, in Yemen, and in the, no in the east, obviously, um, you know, 2014, uh, the Ukrainian crisis. Um, this was compounded, obviously, by the consequences and the effects of the refugee crisis that, um, that the, the European Union and European states um, had to, uh, when, and we still kind of uh, living through those consequences these days. Um, and also increasing kind of geopolitical competition, in particular with Russia in the East. And if that was not enough for the European Union at the time, obviously we had uh, the election of Donald Trump as president in, at, the end of 2000, uh, at the end of 2016, and obviously on top of that, Brexit. So a lot of things were going on at the time, and if you read the, the beginning of the of the European Union global strategy, you will see that they, there was obviously a lot of anxiety and a lot of kind of existential kind of um, uh, doubts about whether the European Union was going to survive this crisis. And it's this con a context of uncertainty and complexity too that explain to some extent the adoption of the term. But as well as this, um, uh, crisis and the worsening of the geopolitical context, we also have to take into account kind of uh, an acknowledgement by the European Union and EU officials that the democratization strategy of the European Union that, that the EU had followed in the previous years had not been successful. And I think the, the Arab Spring and the developments that follow, follow the Arab Spring, but also in the East, kind of show those failures of the EU's democratization strategy as well as more broadly the failures of the liberal peace you know, or the Western interventions in the global south. So all these factors together um, obviously already give us a sense, uh, an explanation of why resilience became uh, particularly, um, how would I say, a particularly kind of exciting term to use, um, attractive term to use in this context. So as, um, as it was put by, by some authors, um, Angela and, and Wagner, um, resilience in this context appears as a kind of a middle ground between kind of liberal strategies and stability uh, that was also kind of, um, uh, that some other people were uh, trying to, to achieve. So it's something kind of in between that kind of satisfies all these different audiences. Again, just to give you a, a kind of a, a, a feeling for kind of what the context was and what the changes uh, the EU global strategy reflects, you, you only have to kind of compare 
the introduction to the two documents, and I'm sure already Natalie talked about this with you, but for example, the, the European security strategy that was written in 2003 starts with Europe has never been so prosperous, so secure, nor so free, while the EU global strategy starts with the, the words, we live in times of existential crisis, within and beyond the European Union, our union is under threat, our European project, which has brought unprecedented peace, prosperity and democracy, is being questioned. So you can see in those words the kind of the changes that the EU was going through and the kind of the context that it was living. And, and also some kind of changes moving from the European security strategy to the EU global strategy in relation to also the way the EU portrayed itself from being this transformative force this kind of very optimistic view that we could change the world, that we could promote our values and our norms beyond uh, Europe to a much more kind of, um, if not pessimistic, much more cautious uh, approach where um, we move towards principal pragmatism, we move towards resilience, resilience building, and also where we put more emphasis on protecting Europe rather than just promoting our values. Uh, beyond uh, our borders. So it's a much more uh, realistic vi uh, vision of what the EU is. And resilience fits within this kind of uh, new uh, understanding of what the EU foreign policy should be. Uh, so just to be more specific, obviously resilience appears as one of the five key priorities of the EU global strategy. And they are not in order, um, and that's what Natalie said, that they were not placed in particular order, but they just kind of had to do it, just place them like that. But obviously the EU has prioritized in particular priority one, which is the security of our union, uh, priority two, uh, promoting uh, resilience in the east and the south, and the promotion of an integrated approach, which is particularly important for the European Union. Let me show you. I say yes. <laughs> I hope it works. Um, so yes. Uh... Over the last year, yeah. important change has begun to. Okay, so just before we start with that one, so this is Federica Mogherini, which you should all know, um, and she's explaining one year after the adoption of the global strategy where they are with these different priorities, and she will obviously refer to resilience as one of them. So I just thought that it would be better to hear what she has to say about the implementation of the global strategy rather than me explain to you, and it's, it's, it's rather short, it's only three minutes happen inside our European Union. We are starting to realize that together, and only together, we can make our citizens more secure. That only together we can make globalization an opportunity and not a threat. And that only together we are a global power in our very difficult world. One year ago, I presented a global strategy for our foreign and security policy. And we all agreed on a shared vision that would translate into common action. One year on, we see the first substantial changes in the way we work together in our European Union. First, we are more conscious that our actions outside Europe have a direct impact on our citizens' daily lives. We are increasing our cooperation against terrorism with our partners around the world to prevent terrorist attacks both inside and outside Europe. We have set up migration compacts with some key countries. We are investing in growth and security in countries of origin and transit so that less people will risk their lives in dangerous journeys. Second, we are doing more to prevent crises before they happen. Almost one-fourth of the world's population lives in fragile states or societies. We work to prevent these fragile situations from turning into a new war, a new humanitarian disaster, a new refugee crisis. This is what we call resilience. As an example, we are supporting private investments in fragile areas with a new external investment plan. Third, we must be prepared to address conflicts in our region and their consequences. 
So we have established a new center for conflict prevention and stabilization. And we're doing more to plan in due time for post-crisis reconstruction, from Syria and Iraq to Nigeria. Because if we want peace, we must prepare for peace. Fourth, we want to preserve multilateralism, starting with the United Nations system. Because for us, Europeans, investing in peacekeeping, investing in humanitarian aid, and in climate action is an investment in our own security. For this reason, we are building strong global alliances to preserve and implement the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Finally, we are taking decisive steps towards a European Union of Security and Defence. We want to help our member states spend their resources more effectively through a permanent structured cooperation on defence projects and a coordinated review of national defence budgets. We have established a single command centre in Brussels for European military training missions. And we are removing the obstacles to the deployment of the European Rapid Reaction Force, the battle groups. Over this last year, our common defence has advanced more than in the previous 60 years. So things can change when we work to turn a vision into action. A stronger and safer European Union is possible. Together, we are making it happen. Okay, so as you can see there, she goes through some of the priorities that I just mentioned. She puts emphasis on resilience, but particularly on the security of our union and the interests of the European Union. Um, and, and she explains some of the initiatives that have been taken in order to move from the vision that the EU global strategy um, uh, presents to action, which is what uh, the strategy is about. It's about you know, ensuring that we can have just not, not only that shared vision, but also action. So resilience is part of that plan of action, and it's about um, you know, focusing particularly in the neighborhood. And I will explain a little bit more about this in a minute. Any questions so far? Anything you want to comment on the video or EU global strategy more generally? Yeah. Having said that, and having said that obviously resilience needs to be contextualized in relation to the EU global strategy, it is also important to say that resilience at the EU level, but also in, in, in the EU member states, did not emerge first with the EU global strategy. The EU was already talking about resilience and resilience building, but that was done in the context of development and humanitarian aid. That's where the first ideas of resilience kind of uh, were uh, initially presented. The difference then was that resilience or the idea of resilience was particularly about focusing on the individual and the community level. And it was about you know, dealing with food crisis, humanitarian crisis, while the, the vision that the EU global strategy presents is a much more kind of uh, comprehensive vision in terms about how we deal with our neighbors beyond and on top of uh, dealing with humanitarian crisis. So it's about having a much more integrated, comprehensive uh, view of how we deal with our neighbors uh, and including security, defense, and also foreign policy as part of that, that picture. That was already kind of evident in the revised ENP, European Neighborhood Policy of 2015, where they refer also to resilience, but alongside stability. Um, the EU global strategy kind of removes the reference to stabilization and then focuses on resilience, also to, to kind of avoid criticisms of being too kind of real politic. Uh, but resilience, as I mentioned, comes from this developmental and humanitarian world. And uh, now the challenge moving forward is how these different actors, developmental actors, humanitarian actors, and foreign and security policy actors are going to work together in order to promote and to implement this vision. And this is still very early days, uh, to be honest. And the way the EU global strategy defines resilience is as the ability of states and societies to reform. 
Uh, again, the first change you can see here is also that you know, the emphasis is not just on community and individuals, but it's also the state level, which kind of developmental actors and humanitarian actors are not so kind of keen to work with because of kind of previous uh, problems. Uh, obviously, foreign policy actors, their main kind of interlocutor is the state, and that's why it needs to come back into the picture. But it also has to do with the fact that different EU member states have very different views about resilience. And for example, France and, 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 and Germany, the way they see resilience is about strengthening states too, as well as communities and individuals, while the UK has a much more communitarian view, much more individualistic view of resilience. So again, the, the rhetoric also reflects some of the kind of um, the controversies at the European level. So if we look at the, at the specific text in the EU global strategy, already, we already mentioned that resilience appears as, a, appears as a response to uncertainty and complexity, and in particular the Euro crisis that the EU was uh, kind of undergoing. Um, this as a way to force the state and societal resilience in the neighborhood, in particular in the east and in the south. So it has kind of some geographical kind of um, focus, although in, in, in following communications it has been expanded to apply to all EU foreign policy. Interestingly, as I will show you now in, a, in the following kind of quote from the strategy, um, the EU global strategy acknowledges again the failures of the past by saying we cannot impose democracy and we have to realize that there are di different states might follow different paths. But at the same time, it also says that the best recipe to promote resilience is to promote human rights, to foster inclusive societies, and to foster democracy. So there, this is something that I discussed in the article, that there is a kind of an inherent contradiction about, yes, we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot uh, encourage particular paths, but the path that we are favoring is this one. So there's a, a, a bit of a contradiction there in terms of what the EU is trying to do, which is not difficult to, it is not easy to solve. Uh, this is the, the quote that I was referring to. I mean, there are many others in the text, but for example, the EU global strategy says that it is in the interest of our citizens to invest in the resilience of state and societies, again, kind of prioritizing the EU's interests when it comes to promoting resilience. So this is not the, the view of the EU as a kind of a normative power um, that we used to have in the past where the EU was doing these things for altruistic motives, promoting values around the world. It is in our interest to do so, and that's why they tried to kind of combine interests and values. And it also mentions, as I was, uh, as I was just saying now, that a resilient society feature the, featuring democracy, trust in the institutions, and sustainable development hearts at the, uh, lies at the heart of a resilient state. So the two of them have to go together. And again, emphasis is on the values, such as democracy, the, the usual EU values. So again, a bit of a kind of a tension there. And, and this tension is particularly uh, kind of particularly evident in the idea of principal pragmatism, which, by the way, has been one of the, seems to be one of the parts of the components of the EU global strategy that has been less kind of followed up. This people has kind of forgotten this part of the EU global strategy that you won't hear many references to principal pragmatism these days. And I think it has to do with the fact that you know, the kind of the concept, the concept already, despite the fact that it tries to bridge values and norms, bring them, bring them together, it doesn't really successfully achieve that because, you know, there's still those tensions about double standards, do we follow our interests, what happens when the interests uh, clash with values and the promotion of values, um, can we um, promote the resilience of individuals and communities, uh, and at the same time build resilient, the resilience of kind of authoritarian states. So there's a lot of contradictions there in terms of principle pragmatism that, you know, that the kind of the EU global strategy doesn't resolve and that even the following communications do not resolve. And, and I think that's perhaps why policymakers at the EU level have been much more careful to refer to this idea of, of principle pragmatism. And 
you know, it's kind of the, the same criticisms that we had heard in the past in relation to EU foreign policy continue to, to kind of to haunt EU foreign policy in relation to selectivity, double standards, and, and the idea that resilience is seen by some people as a substitute for stability. Uh, and also others even think um, more cynically that resilience is just a way to to kind of to intervene abroad in times of austerity by shifting responsibility to the targeted populations. So you can think about that in those terms. Um, resilience is also very linked to another of the priorities of the EU global strategy, as I will mention later, which is the promotion of an integrated approach. And you must have come across the idea of comprehensive approach, integrated approach, when you refer to the EU foreign policy, and more generally to concepts such as coherence and consistency. And this has been a, um, you know, I, it has been a constant in EU foreign policy since the 1980s. This idea that we have to achieve more coherence, more integration, and more comprehensiveness in our foreign policy. Resilience cannot be achieved without that integrated approach. And at the same time, resilience contributes to achieving the integrated approach. So the two of, the two of them go hand in hand. Um, but obviously resilience and the implementation of resilience suffers from the fact that this integrated approach is very difficult to achieve in practice. And that even, you know, 20, 30 years after kind of the CFSP was launched, we still have a lot of problems in terms of achieving coordination between different actors at different levels, both in Brussels and on the ground, despite the rhetoric of the integrated approach. Um, the idea of resilience, as, as put forward by the, by the EU Global Strategy, has been then developed in different um, communications later on. For example, there was a joint communication on resilience, which puts together a broader understanding and expands, as I mentioned before, the geographical scope from the very close neighborhood to the whole of the EU's external action, and puts forward a number of initiatives, in particular those that go kind of linked to the integrated approach, which is shared risk analysis, more early warning, joint EU programming and financing, uh, kind of cooperation with other organizations, etc. And at the, at the heart of that joint communication is the idea that we need to f uh, achieve a much more strategic approach to resilience by mobilizing all the different actors that are uh, part of EU foreign policy. And it, then it puts forward a number of principles. I'll, I'll, I won't go through this, but, but you can read in the communication um, that will help implement um, resilience in practice. As you can see there, the ones that will uh, highlight, for example, is the fact that resilience is not an end in itself, but just a, a way of achieving particular goals, and the EU refers again to the goals of promoting democracy, rule of law, human rights, and, and you know, the traditional EU values. And secondly, that resilience shouldn't be seen as a form to promote a status quo. They should be about transformation. And I think the other ones, you know, the, the idea that we need to be more, much more flexible, that we need to focus on early action and prevention, and that what we need to put in place is an analysis of strengths, vulnerabilities, and pressures. And this is what I'm going to focus here by applying this to the Western Balkans. Um, so just to summarize before we move to the Western Balkans, what, can, what contribution can resilience then make to EU foreign policy? So this is kind of ideally what should we be looking for in terms of how can this transform European foreign policy? Well, the first thing that it can do is it provides a much more kind of nuanced understanding of the kind of the global context, and in particular, it brings in ideas of complexity. And this means that we need to focus on structural foreign policy, on kind of prevention measures, on early action, on preparedness, because we cannot predict. So since you cannot predict, then the best thing is to be prepared. 
and it is also to try to you know focus on 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 dealing with the kind of the everyday the structural roots and, and kind of the causes of conflict the second thing that it brings together and that I develop in more detail in the article is the idea of pragmatism, that we need to be much more pragmatic, focus on the practical consequences of our actions rather than on kind of universal moral values because we're moving from these kind of linear to non-linear models of uh, causation and we need to be much more flexible in our approach. And the other two uh, that follow from this is, for, is the fact that we need a much more integrated, more a systems approach because of these complexities. So everyone needs to be, uh, you know, every different levels, different actors, different uh, uh, approaches need to be brought together into a more, much more join up foreign policy. And finally, um, you know, kind of resilience and this approach uh, to resilience to your foreign policy also connects with ideas that have been developed in peace building of the local, local turn. We have to look at the internal capacities, human capacities, agency, in order to, to be much more effective. So it's not about kind of imposing or, or doing things for others, it's about facilitating and promoting the kind of the uh, adaptive capacities of local actors and kind of ensuring kind of learning and adaptation. So that, those are the kind of the four things that I think resilience can add in terms of what EU, the EU foreign policy should be about. Uh, the question is whether this apply to the Western Balkans, for example, and although we can discuss other areas too. In the Western Balkans, obviously, as you know already from the discussion and enlargement, the EU has been involved for many years, decades, and, and still involved in the Western Balkans with different countries being at different stages in the process of enlargement. More recently, and following the EU global strategy, the EU has tried to kind of um, develop some of these ideas in a new EU strategy for the Western Balkans, an EU action plan which focuses or puts also an emphasis on resilience building. Um, from my point of view, uh, what resilience can also bring, and I think this was done very nicely in that kind of study from the EU ISS, is a focus and a mapping of the internal drivers of fragility uh, versus also that, uh, as well as the external drivers of fragility. And then we also need to look at strengthening resilience by looking at the drivers of resilience, the internal capacities, and how do we build, how do we foster those existing capacities rather than replacing them with, you know, from the outside by, by external actors. So if we apply that kind of framework of internal drivers, external drivers, and, and uh, how do we strengthen those existing capacities, the first thing that we need to in the case of the Balkans, what we can see is that when it comes to internal drivers, there are, very, uh, there are some domestic vulnerabilities that the EU needs to kind of factor in uh, when it comes to improving resilience. Some of them refer to corruption, state capture, authoritarianism, or the increase in authoritarian tendencies in the region, and obviously the, the long-standing ethnic, political conflicts, economic issues, climate change, etc. I'll, I'll discuss some of these uh, individually. Then obviously external drivers of fragility, which we can also discuss during the Q&A sec uh, session, are uh, the role of external actors such as Russia, China, we could also include Turkey, the US, and others, but I'm, I'm only going to focus on those two because of time constraints. And then I'll mention a little bit on uh, how do we build on existing capabilities and how can the EU do so? So internal drivers of fragility in the case of the Balkans, obviously the first one, and well, I'm saying the first one because I think this is where most people coming from the region, this is what would be the kind of the main concern for most people coming from the region, which is the economic situation. Um, so this is where you know, and, and most of the vulnerabilities in the region have to do with that weak economic situation. So even, even despite the economic growth in recent years, um, it will still take around 60 years for, the, for most of the Western Balkan countries to kind of to 
to be at the same level, the same economic uh, developmental level as the rest of the EU member states in terms of GDP per capita. I think the main problem, and on that obviously the perceptions of economic, I'm not sure you can see everything there, but the, the graph at the end refers to how pessimistic or optimistic people in the region are about the economic situation, and the blue side is, refers to pessimistic while the yellow uh, relates to optimistic. So you can see that most of the people in the region are rather pessimistic about the kind of the economic prospects of the countries in the region. And this obviously uh, leads to particular problems such as, uh, or links to particular problems such as um, youth unemployment, which is uh, the rates are particularly high in the Western Balkans. And then this leads to other serious problems such as you know, emigration of very, you know, educated, capable people and also sometimes not, ca not so educated people outside the region, especially to the EU, which, we, which has the consequences of brain, bra what we call brain drain, but also leads to all the kind of dependencies, for example, the fact that the region is very dependent on remittances from those emigrants uh, and how they then, um, you know, how this makes the, um, the economies of the country very dependent from these external sources. So this is just some of the kind of the economic um, drivers of fragility. We can discuss this in more detail. <clears throat> Obviously, the ones that you will be more aware of are the, the ones that relate to the legacies of conflict. We still, we, we still have disputed borders in the region and sometimes disputed statehoods. Uh, some states are not. Not everyone recognizes them. Um, a lot of na nationalist politics, um, in particular rhetoric, uh, which obviously fits from that economic situation, but also you know, the, the experiences of the conflicts in the 1990s and early 2000s. This then also fits into informal clientelistic networks, which then feed corruption, uh, and then also result in, uh, or are also linked to ethnically segregated communities. And this is particularly visible when it comes to the education system. Um, again, in terms of the kind of the political uh, drivers of fragility we also have and in relation to the previous one is the you can see here corruption is a particular um, particularly serious problem in the region in, and you can see here so these are the perceptions of corruption which have worsened in in recent year in most of the countries and also what we call uh, the rise of the stabilitocrats so these are political elites that are you know are committed to maintaining the status quo um, as well as kind of, you know, try looking like they are doing some reforms, but in fact they are paying kind of uh, lip service to, to EU uh, reforms, as you might have already discussed during your courses. Uh, the map here shows the decline in political freedoms in countries in the region, so in all of them, uh, or in most of them, uh, political freedoms have declined in recent years, and this is not just in the Western Balkans, this also applies to other Eastern European countries. And, and you can also see reflected just when it comes to the countries in the region in the graph uh, next to it. So the, uh, the Freedom House reports in particular, the 2017 was particularly bleak when it came to um, the state of democracy. Uh, but also the freedom of the press in the, in the region. So this is also another driver of fragility that the EU should be rather concerned. And I think some of the criticisms of the EU is that, you know, it's kind of not been tough enough on some of these uh, stabilitocrats or not as um, it, has, it has sometimes, you know, uh, not been uh, taking them seriously just because they maintain stability in the region, which is also in the EU's interest. Obviously, this comes in the back or in the context of further undermining of democratic systems in the Western world, but also in the non-Western world. 
So it's not surprising that many political elites in the Western Balkans are using other kind of models of, um, you know, kind of this really, um, you know, um, authoritarian regimes and authoritarian leader as their own model in the in the Balkans, from you know, from Putin to uh, Erdogan to now, also uh, more worrying trends in Europe and in the U.S. So, so obviously this kind of fits into into these problems in the Western Balkans. And then when it comes to the external drivers of fragility, obviously we need to mention the role of some external actors. Some of these, uh, the role of some of these external actors is um, obviously doesn't directly undermine, but it can undermine some of the reforms that the EU is, uh, in, is pushing for in the countries of the Western Balkans, particularly uh, the role of China, but the role of China has been mostly an economic one so far. So it's been kind of uh, providing a lot of investments to the region, uh, investment that doesn't have a string attached in terms of you know, particular reforms. So the countries in the region are very happy to take those, those loans, although they do have other strings, like for example, they have to um, you know, use workers coming from China or they have other conditions, but it doesn't have conditions when it comes to you know, the promotion of liberal values. So they're quite happy to take that money. Um, competition from Russia, however, is much more um, interesting in the sense that it not only competes in economic terms with the EU, um, or at least um, it competes mostly on political terms and the kind of the political influence that Russia has in the region. In economic terms, actually, you will see that you know the investment from Russia in the region you know pales in comparison to the money that comes from the EU. Yet, still, the perceptions in the region about the, the, the uh, Russian influence, but in particular in, in Serbia, is quite striking the difference between the actual investment and how they are perceived by Serbians. Um, and also you, you have a similar uh, case in, uh, for example, in Republika Srpska. Um, there's obviously very kind of concrete forms of dependence, in particular in, in terms of energy dependence, but yet kind of the actual numbers show that the economic dependence is very low, yet still the political influence is quite high if you compare it. So this is a form of competition and a kind of a, an external driver of fragility that the EU also needs to take into account when it comes to promoting resilience in the, in the, in the region. So at the moment, I'm not, I'm not saying that the countries are going in the wrong direction, but you know, there, there is some kind of question marks there about which, towards which direction uh, they are progressing, especially because of the lack of commitment from, you know, sometimes from EU policymakers. So the situation of the countries, as you know, is it, you know differs depending on which country we look at. In, when it comes to Euro-Atlantic integration, with some countries having made more, more progress than than other countries, but in general terms, what we've seen in the past five, ten years is very much kind of a you know um, you know slow slowdown of the kind of the process of integration. It's been very slow and very kind of painful in particular countries. Yet um, the countries in the region and the EU policymakers still want to see the EU as a security provider, but the kind of the message that they are sending to the region are quite mixed. So this might also undermine uh, the EU's efforts to promote resilience in the region. So these are the kind of the negative pictures. So we look at the positive picture in terms of drivers of resilience. Uh, there's some things there that kind of provide some um, room for optimism or some kind of um, positive signs. In particular, obviously, um, you know, a credible EU perspective is still um, is the main kind of driver of resilience in the region, especially when supported by EU member state initiatives such as the Berlin process or other uh, bilateral um, initiatives, but as I said, it has been quite mixed in recent years. Sometimes, you know, we see that commitment. Other times, we, you know, enlargement, fat enlargement fatigue sets in, and you don't see very much happening, which obviously uh, discourages, um, you know, Western Balkan countries to cooperate and to uh, adopt reforms. 
We also see some kind of positive signs when it comes to cooperation and reconciliation in the region, for example, uh, the signature of a transport community treaty, a regional economic establishment of a regional economic area. However, we still very early days uh, in terms of whether this will make any, diff uh, any difference or whether it will be successful or not. So these are very recent initiatives. There are obviously very positive signs with the North Macedonia name deal. That's one of the good news, at least, that we have got in, the, in recent months. There's been, like, there's been economic growth, uh, in particular in the, in the past three, four years, and there's still kind of predictions for continued economic growth in the years to come. The problem with economic growth in the region is that it's not, um, as in other cases, it's not well distributed. And, you know, most of the economic growth has, has um, benefited uh, those that were involved in privatization initiatives that have links with foreign direct investment or that can get into this kind of informal networks, clientelistic networks, but it doesn't kind of benefit the general population. So economic growth is positive, but is not as good as we could expect. Um, a very vibrant, uh, vibrant civil society is also a, a very important internal capacity that the Western Balkans have, and that could be mobilized more both by the Western Balkan countries themselves, but especially supported and facilitated by the EU more than it does now. And I think that would be key, especially in a context of you know, this rising authoritarian, authoritarian tendency in, in the region. That's where the EU should be putting more uh, focus. Um, and uh, Florian Vive, for example, have also, has also referred to the Balkans getting used to crisis as a form of resilience, which has positive uh, connotations in the sense that obviously the countries in the region are very used to enduring crisis for, you know, over the past two, three decades. But that also means that because they are used to that, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, any kind of efforts of transformation of kind of um, going against the status quo kind of weaken over time because kind of people get used to it. So there's no much of a kind of impetus for change, for transformation. So it has its positives and its negatives. Um, so just to finish, uh, I think uh, just with a couple of things. So generally, in terms of uh, kind of assessing the record of the EU so far, I mean, my, my, my own research is on security and defense policy, so I'm kind of focuses on that. So what I can see that in terms of the EU's foreign policy in the, in the region is that most of the emphasis has been on kind of on EU kind of um, objectives, such as, for example, promoting a much more integrated and coordinated approach. So that has you know, the EU has spent a lot of energy in trying to achieve that on the ground and also in Brussels. It has also um, spent a lot of energy and efforts in building a capable state in the countries in the region. But by a capable state, I mean a very particular model of a state, which, you know, which follows this kind of Bavaria, liberal, centralized, functionalist form of a state. So this form of a state not always reflects the realities on the ground, informal kind of client uh, networks, uh, informal practices, and the interests of those in the region. So, um, so that also explains to some extent why these um, kind of these objectives, uh, this object objective of building a capable state has not been as successful as it should have. And, and this obviously is linked to the other two problems that the EU has faced in the region, is the fact that despite the rhetoric of local ownership, it hasn't embraced that in practice. So it has invo involved some of the local actors in the implementation sometimes, but in most cases it hasn't involved them in the decision making, in the evaluation of initiatives, or in kind of in the broader kind of a strategic um, Design of of and, and kind of the design of the kind of the roadmap for the region, and obviously this has undermined the sustainability and the legitimacy of many of the 
EU initiatives in the region, in particular the ones that I have been looking at, which are uh, related to CSDP operations, security sector reform, etc. So, to conclude, um, so what's the contribution of resilience to foreign policy? I do think that it has a lot of added value in the sense that it kind of pushes for a much more anticipatory, structural, kind of focusing on prevention foreign policy rather than the kind of ad hoc, um, you know, respond uh, kind of uh, foreign policy. It also still emphasizes this need for a more join up foreign policy, although it doesn't always uh, successfully achieve that. And for me, the, most, the two most important kind of contributions to foreign policy is the focus on adaptive capacities and learning at the local level. So how do we encourage those existing capacities at the local level? And how do we engage with those? And how do we facilitate those without kind of replacing them or imposing them from the outside? And it also allows us to have a much more pragmatic and flexible uh, foreign policy in the sense that the focus is on, on, on the realities on the ground, on, con on the effects of concrete action rather than on the kind of the moral, uh, kind of more kind of Western liberal values that the EU has exposed in the past. So this is what ideally it could contribute. In practice, however, that doesn't always happen because, um, you know, the institutional complexity of the EU, which I don't have time now to, to go into detail, but that obviously goes, uh, that prevents this join up foreign policy, prevents this kind of much more anticipatory foreign policy. Because of path dependencies in terms of the EU, it's used to act in a particular way and it's very difficult to change the way it does things. So it's very difficult to be flexible, to be pragmatic, to respond quickly because it has all these systems in place that are very difficult to mobilize in a, in a particular di direction. And this is particularly the case with financing mechanisms that it can deploy. And also because of the liberal rather than the post-liberal kind of nature of, for, of EU foreign policy. So despite the fact that resilience is agnostic about the kind of the goals that should be promoted, the EU foreign policy is still very committed, is still wedded to a, a liberal understanding of the world and a very linear understanding of the world where, you know, where the EU is supposed to achieve a particular goal at the end. So that also uh, gets some in the way of this focus on adaptive capacities, learning, and agency at the local level. So going forward, key challenges will be how do we uh, ensure that the EU kind of um, bridges this, this kind of um, this kind of um, tension between interests and values. How do we promote the EU's interests and at the same time the EU's values? I don't think that you has resolved that tension or will be able to resolve that tension. Um, how does the EU promote the stabilization, which is one of the key goals, in particular linked to this idea of promoting and protecting the EU, and at the same time allows for adaptation, recovery, and learning? How do we ensure that promoting the resilience of a state is not going to undermine the societal resilience and individual resilience? And how does the EU uh, kind of take uh, into account and foster more local ownership, uh, which is part of the EU's current rhetoric? So I think these, these challenges are still um, to be solved and they are particularly relevant to the, to the question and to the issue of resilience. Uh, so that's everything from me. Sorry for the long discussion. Thank you, it was very interesting. I come back next week because you do a much better job than I do in <laughs> teaching. <laughs> Um, so we have time for some questions, so I'd like very much to give you the opportunity to ask anything you want. As always, I'll come with the microphone, otherwise I cannot hear you.
for those of you who are not familiar with the class, I, you can also ask a question in Italian if you feel more comfortable. I can translate it. There's no problem. Even in French. <laughs> not in German, though. issues sink in a little bit. Good afternoon. Yes, Sven, give you the microphone. Uh, first, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question would be, um, if you uh, realized any change in the way um, the EU is perceived as a soft power outside the EU, because with this uh, change in their, their principles to, um, to this form of resilience, uh, it's, uh, I mean, we, you refer to it that the, the responsibility in some cases are, is shifted and given to external actors and how this, uh, how this um, might have changed the perception of the US and soft power. That's a brilliant question. Thank you very much for that. Um, still very early days and in the sense, I mean obviously the EU is following similar um, trends that other international actors are kind of following. So both the UN you know, the UK and also US foreign policy development and humanitarian kind of foreign policy have embraced this idea of resilience. So it's not unique to the EU in that regard. Um, has, does this undermine uh, the EU's kind of view of a soft power? I think the problem was that, that that image was already undermined in the past because of the kind of the contradictions that of the EU's foreign policy, the fact that the EU kind of used to have double standards in terms of how it will treat particular states versus other states, how they dealt with authoritarian regimes in one region and how they dealt with those in another region. So there was already a lot of, you know, question marks about the EU soft power, in particular in the neighborhood. Um, does the move to resilience change anything? Um, res countries tend to like the idea of partner countries tend to like this idea of resilience because uh, everyone wants to be resilient, right? Doesn't, it doesn't have negative connotations. Everyone, you know, is happy to develop their capacities to build resilience. What they didn't like in the past was being told to be a particular type of, of state, a liberal state or democratic state. In particular, some states didn't like that, that idea. And so they kind of like the language of resilience, including the Western Balkan countries. They, you know, they like that language because it doesn't kind of label them as fragile, as vulnerable, as underdeveloped, or kind of, it doesn't have those negative connotations that other terms have. Um, the kind of the soft power of the EU is, has been undermined more because of other kind of, uh, other kind of things that are going on. And I think it has to do more with the, uh, the fact that liberal democracy has been undermined within the EU. That's what, in my mind, is undermining more the EU's kind of image outside, rather than this kind of change in terminology. Uh, the fact that, you know, countries such as, you know, some Eastern European countries and Central, Central Eastern European countries in particular are, you know, are not um, respecting kind of EU principles when it comes to the rule of law. So then countries in the Balkans say, so why are we supposed to respect them when these guys are not? So I, I think that kind of creates more problems than the, you know, the move towards resilience. And as I said, this idea of principle pragmatism hasn't really kind of taken, uh, you know, so it hasn't been taken up much by EU foreign policy makers, so it wouldn't undermine the EU's foreign policy in any case. So I think it's, it's mostly those internal kind of um, processes that are undermining, as well as Brexit. Brexit also has a, um, an impact on the EU's soft power. 
because for the first time one country doesn't want to be an EU member state. So all the countries are like, mm, so he, they don't want to be an EU member state. Do we still want to be one? You know, so that also undermines the kind of the attraction power of the EU to some extent. But yeah, I don't think Brazilian does in, in, in that sense because you know, it's a term that people tend to like, especially kind of authoritarian and semi-authoritarian regimes. More questions? Questions? So I'm going to, if I may ask you one question, and uh, so I give a few minutes to the students to think reflect on what you presented. And um, I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit on um, something that you talked about a little bit in passing, but perhaps uh, it is worth mentioning a little bit more in depth, uh, that is um, uh, this idea of the local turn, ownership, and resilience, so the, the three concepts all together, because it all sounds good. I mean, yeah. we should focus more on the local, there should be more ownership. Um, Timothy Donet, published a famous article and book, and then a book uh, where at some point he explains that uh, we, we are all in favor of local ownership, but uh, if we take local ownership seriously, then the role of the international community is simply to um, sign a check and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. So while the rhetoric is uh, appealing, while the local turn we should focus to on the local resources, etc., sounds like an appealing idea, like very much like resilience, uh, the intuitive level, then the implementation of the, then there are strong obstacles uh, to the actual implementation. So how can we, I guess uh, the question is, uh, both conceptually and then in practice, perhaps if you have any suggestion, how can we um, overcome these limitations? If there, uh, there's not one way, I guess, but if you have any suggestion mm -hmm. on how to address this problem. Yeah, so the first thing I would kind of say is obviously resilience is in very connected to this idea of the local turn and local agencies um, and local ownership because resilience about the ability of an individual or a community of a state to, to cope, to withstand those external shocks. So it's not that the ability of someone you know, doing it for you, it's, it's about this ability that you have yourself, this self-organization, this, um, you know, this ability to learn, to adapt, to change to these external shocks and crises. So that's why resilience is you know, very connected to these ideas that have emerged in the peace building literature about local ownership and how local ownership ensures uh, effectiveness and sustainability of, of uh, reform efforts. So this is the first thing, and that's why the two are directly connected. So if the EU is committed to promoting the resilience, then it has to adopt that role of, you know, this is, you know, we are going to support you in pursuing your own goals, in, you know, in facilitating learning, adaptation, but we are not going to do it for you. So if the EU is committed to resilience, then it has to be committed to local ownership, whether it likes it or not. If they are not happy with that, and what they want is something else, or if the EU, what the EU wants is to promote a particular form of a state, a liberal state, our, you know, a uh, state that respects human rights, a state that respects the rule of law, a state that looks like the Euro EU states, then it will have problems with the concept of resilience and the problems uh, and problems with the concept of local ownership. So I think my, my view is that there is an inherent contradiction in the language of the EU trying to do both things at the same time. And I don't think you can resolve that contradiction. So either you say clearly, we are still for liberal values, we are still for this particular model of a state, these are the reforms that you have to undertake in order to benefit from this form of assistance, or they say, no, we are for resilience, we are for self-organization, we are for agency at the local level. But both of them at the same time are still 
Donne had um, you know explained before and others have already demonstrated is not is not kind of possible to recon reconcile that that's you know I completely agree with that back to you yes Alessandra Um, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask you because um, the last week we had a host talking about the social movements in the Balkans and I personally think that uh, these movements uh, are drivers of resilience because they, um, they um, sustain uh, like uh, important principles. Um, what do you think uh, should be the position of the EU's because often these movements are, are like repressed by the government. So, thank you. You know, I think that's again a very, very good question and a very good comment because I completely agree with you that they are key drivers of resilience and one of the few kind of elements in, well, not few, there are obviously others, but one of the few kind of political elements that give us hope in terms of transcending some kind of ethnic, uh, transcending ethnic lines and going towards a much more civic model of kind of, of um, uh, coexistence, if you want, in the, in the Western Balkans and towards uh, reconciliation. And, and as I mentioned before, the EU has been quite hesitant at times in, in supporting those uh, social movements because obviously they are destabil destabilizing in particular, particular moments in time. They also being very kind of narrow focus, the social movements themselves, they generally focus on particular concrete demands rather than kind of asking for more, you know, more transformation. So in that sense, they have been so far quite limited, but they also haven't received the support that they could have had from, uh, from the European Union and from EU member states. And obviously the support that they need is, has to be political um, so we're not talking about kind of NGOs just providing, it's about, you know, it's a polit they have to become a political movement that kind of challenges those uh, more authoritarian trends that we've seen kind of growing in the region. And yeah, and I, I do agree that, you know, that you could do more either in terms of, uh, you know, discursively, but also in practice of supporting those social mov movements that sometimes even transcend kind of um, you know, country kind of borders and, and kind of geographical kind of delimitation. So, yeah, how could it do that? It's, um, you know, as I say, could at least acknowledge them and support them um, more in the, in the kind of the political um, discourses of the EU and then with perhaps more co concrete uh, measures. But again, those, those, those forms of resilience are organic are, you know, they emerge spontaneously, and those are the forms of resilience that we're talking about, rather than kind of being externally driven. If they become externally driven, then, then I think they, they will be more, much more problematic, and, you know, they will have problems in achieving kind of the goals. So it has to be just facilitation. Yes. Uh, in uh, divided societies like the Balkans, for example, uh, how can the EU, the EU uh, achieve uh, social, so society resilience, uh, local ownership, if, for example, a, min a minority is discriminated by the majority? Where, how can the EU intervene in these cases? How can it build resilience? Uh, because it risks uh, imposing, uh, for example, if it intervenes, it risks, uh, I think, uh, uh, imposing its values and uh, exacerbate the conflict, I think, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, th I think you kind of answer your own question. I completely agree. You know, as I say, if it's about resilience building, you have to, you know, keep a hands of approach. Uh, you cannot intervene directly. You have to allow these processes to emerge organically and within the societies. You can support from the outside, you know, but you cannot, uh, 
you know, you cannot do it from the outside because either if you do it, it will be forced, and secondly, it will not be sustainable. And again, and it could also have negative consequences, which is what we've seen in past inter international interventions. If you are talking about the enlargement process, though, there's a different type of process. In the enlargement process, there are particular rules and particular norms that countries have to follow. And in that sense, that's, the, that's where the EU can kind of uh, use and stick um, kind of more kind of an incentive, stick approach. Uh, but when it comes to more broader international interventions, then you know, the, the ability of the EU to, to you know, intervene in those uh, situations is much more limited, especially if it's, if it's trying to comply or to follow these ideas of resilience building. And this is kind of, kind of yeah, this is half-half um, acknowledge in the in the EU global strategy when they talk about different paths. So they're talking about you know the different countries will take different paths to a, to you know to arrive to more inclusive societies, but that the role of the EU should be just a facilitator. Uh, another thing I found really interesting is the question you made in the presentation, um, who should be made resilient, um, especially regarding uh, the, the uh, events in uh, North African countries, uh, so the cooperations with uh, countries like Niger to uh, control the, the migration movements in the region. And uh, there was an argument you referred to in your article um, that uh, some scholars made that uh, the whole process uh, or the whole change to, to more resilient uh, foreign policy uh, could be also understood as a, um, as a uh, change to change back to more neoliberal uh, politics. And um, I have to think <laughs> one second. Um, and I think that that really fits uh, uh, somehow together because uh, um, this this critic or this argument the scholars made um, you can you can see them in, in the way that uh, either the EU is giving away the responsibility or not taking responsibility where it used to do so. And um, it's now uh, um, uh, focusing m uh, more again on, on the uh, stability of the market. And my question would be, um, how do you evaluate the developments since the global strategy, so the last two, three years, and uh, what do you think about this, this criticism? I, th I think it's a very relevant criticism. I think you're referring to this much more real politic approach to EU foreign policy, where kind of the EU's interests drive, you know, these particular initiatives, whether it's in the in, in North Africa, or whether it's in Eastern Europe, or whether it's in the Balkans, where the EU is kind of um, saying, you know, I will, you know, it is your responsibility. To do this, but also we also need to focus on our own interests, such as you know protecting ourselves from external threats, whether it's migration, terrorism, or else. And I think that is problematic um, on many levels, and I think that will again undermine the EU's kind of image of soft power, because it will be seen as pursuing if if more than even more than before its own interests and that's why for example even when it comes to migration in North Africa lots of countries from the region have kind of um, you know have kind of contested you know the EU's idea of for example establishing uh, centers uh, in in their own country saying why should we be doing this this is not you know something that we need if it's in your interest you should be doing it yourselves um, so yeah, I think that will again undermine. And I think the, the trend over the past two, three years has been um, certainly a much more security-driven uh, EU, uh, in particular when it comes to migration. 
and this has affected um, not only CSDP operations, which are not much more focused on migration-related issues and kind of, secu kind of hard security issues, but also other policies, such as development policy. Um, we've seen, for example, um, discussions about um, the capacity building for security and development initiative, which kind of uh, transfer funds from development towards capacity building and security. Uh, we've seen other initiatives, the European intervention, um, what's it called? Initiative, one of those, can't remember one of those, but it, again, it goes in the same, uh, follows the same kind of rationale of, you know, strengthening the capability of our partners so that we don't have to do it ourselves. So all these initiatives suggest that they, you know, there's been a kind of securitization of EU foreign policy and also that resilience has led to kind of, yeah, shifting responsibility to our partners so that they can develop their own capabilities so that they will defend us for ex from external threats. So that, that's kind of the trend that we've seen in, in the past two, three years. Good. We have time for one last question, if there is any. Can you join me? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your questions. And, um, you know, now the sun is, sun is out. <laughs> Yay. So thank you very much. It was a, it was a pleasure. <laughs>